Here we go. We are recording and I will get my slides going. How's everyone doing today? All doing okay? Meh. Okay, so far, Lois, nice, fine. Just a lot of ringing endorsements for the day. I get it. I am also like pretty meh to okay. Um, all right, friends, let me start the share. I'll start this and then let me get again like I'm just so I'm so off my game. Let me get my chat up. Let me get my participant stuff up. Okay. Let's see if anybody else emailed me and said they wanted to join. Okay. Where are you chat? I do have a couple of links that I am going to be putting in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. This is just a new one from Slides Carnival. Um, I like it. I changed the, um, it comes with that sort of skinny, um, I can't remember what it's called, a matic maybe, a skinny header font, but I really like this scribbly one. So I changed it to that thanks to Maggie, actually. I was like, Maggie, look at this and tell me what font to use. Okay, let's do this thing. Um, so let me go ahead in the slides um, and link you to the slides in case you want to follow along. I'm really proud that this is going to be on video, me struggling through um, that Zoom life. Okay. All right, there we go. All right, so I am starting. So I wanna just introduce right now what I sort of mean by this concept. Um, to my knowledge, this is not some kind of generally like widely accepted term for what I'm gonna talk about. Um, so I want to just sort of break it down and sort of operationalize it based on the definition that I am using again, not, not, um, not that it's always gonna mean this, but here's what it means to me. Um, I am using it to encompass this set of practices I'm thinking of um, as being intentionally uh, or being intentional about integrating and citing sources of different types. So a lot of the literature and the resources I'm going to show you today are more focused on this first thing in my list here, um, bringing in voices um, of authors from underrepresented groups, and that could be underrepresented um, often they, they're either based on gender or um, sort of racial or ethnic background. Um, so that's what, what we'll see in a lot of the resources we talk about today, um, bringing in folks who are underrepresented in that way. Another thing that I have seen that I would consider a critical citation practice is sort of intentionally, consciously bringing in sources that are only available through open access, or I shouldn't say only, I guess. Technically, these things are also still available to us through our databases, but um, that are open access. And then um, another sort of thread that I've explored a little bit, but I don't know a ton about, is um, sources that represent different epistemological perspectives. So different ways of knowing, different um, knowledge practices. Um, and I'm going to give you some examples of all of these today. Um, and I'm going to start with this really long quote, so I apologize, but I am going to read it. Um, this is um, one of the first sort of scholarly pieces that got me sort of interested in this idea. And even before I had seen this article, um, a student in a one, one of my liaison areas is women's gender and sexuality studies, and a student in one of my capstone classes or one of the capstone classes I was working with had come to me and said, I'm doing this project on environmental justice and environmental racism in North Carolina. And I really wanna cite some North Carolina BIPOC scholars. Um, and that presented sort of a specific challenge, um, but this was something that again, she was like really consciously intentionally trying to do. And we spent some time sort of researching who is doing this kind of work that identifies as BIPOC, um, how are we going to locate that kind of information? How are we going to find these folks who are doing this work? 
Um, and so I came across this article a bit later um, from Mott and Cochane. Um, and this is from a, a feminist geography journal. And I do have citations, which you'll see when we go to the resource guide. Um, but they are, they did sort of an audit of um, geography literature to look at representation, particularly by gender in this particular example, but they are both interested in sort of wider sort of politics of citation. So they say, we argue for a conscientious engagement with the, and that emphasis is theirs, by the way, with the politics of citation that is mindful of how citational practices can be tools for either the reification of or resistance to unethical hierarchies of knowledge. Our approach is qualitative and conceptual and offers a productive way to understand how citation can be rethought as a feminist and anti-racist technology. To ignore the politics of citation risks the continued hegemony of white heteromasculine knowledge production incongruous with the nuance and richness of other understandings of and perspectives on geographical phenomena. Now, if you've read a lot of scholarly articles or if you have read any theory, this kind of like super dense language is, is not gonna be um, you know, a surprise to you, but I like to unpack this kind of thing um, so I can make sure I'm getting what's really important. So to me, some of the really key concepts that come out from this passage is that idea of conscientious engagement. So I, I think I described it in my personal definition as something like intentional um, same kind of thing, conscious, conscientious, intentional, this engagement with, and they call it the politics of citation, which is a term you hear if you um, look into this sort of this work. Um, also important, I thought from this passage is this concept of unethical hierarchies of knowledge. Um, and I think they're using unethical in this way to sort of un unearned in a way, right? We tend to prioritize hierarchies of knowledge that focus peer-reviewed articles, peer, the peer review process has for many, many decades um, really centralized uh, a particular kind of white male scholarship, like they talk about it down there, white heteromasculine knowledge production. Um, so looking at these hierarchies of knowledge and trying to figure out not only why are those the things that we value, um, but also why have so many voices been left out of that particular um, sort of form of knowledge production. And then finally, I just love thinking back on this idea of citation, like the potential for citation to be a feminist and anti-racist technology, a way that we can sort of do activism in our scholarship, in our presentations, in, you know, sort of the kind of things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So at this point, I just want to stop and ask if anyone has any questions or wants any clarification on anything so far. Okay, please feel free to put anything you want to ask or comment in the chat or raise your hand or unmute yourself. Um, we are a small but mighty group of um, wonderful people here today. Okay, so I am gonna ask you a quick question at this point before we go forward and I'm gonna show you a couple of little case studies. When you are doing um, a writing or research project, so whether it is you know an article that you're writing or um, a report that you have to write for your job or a presentation that you're going to do, how do you make this decision? How do you decide, or how have you decided in the past, like what you want to cite when you're engaged in that kind of project? Like what try to sort of um, break down that process in your mind. And again, I'm going to give you a moment to think about this, but please feel free to use the chat, um, use uh, the, you know, use your microphone if you have one, that kind of thing. Um, and I will give you a moment. I'll unmute. I'm feeling brave. Hey, so I mean, I think as a librarian, I do like a pretty deep dive into searching and search multiple places. And, and so I, I think that I really go based on relevance. And I don't really, I mean, I probably shouldn't admit this out loud, but like, when I'm doing research, I don't necessarily know who the important scholars are. That was air quoted. You just can't see me. 
the important scholars are on a particular topic. I just go like strictly with what's relevant. Okay. Um, Lois usually tries to pick the most relevant concept or quote, excellent, um, that supports the argument or research. Sometimes there are restrictions from the professor, like you have to pick things from like a certain a certain um, time range. And Anna says relevance as well. So a, a couple of things I wanna point out here. I think this is what most of us do. Um, I don't, uh, especially as, as like coming from as library workers, um, you know, I work with fields that I didn't personally study. So like Amy's saying, I don't always know like, who are the big names here? I'm usually focused really on relevance. Is this relevant to the topic I'm working on or that I'm helping a student work on? And Lois brings up a really important point that um, often, particularly in an academic setting, there are gonna be some restrictions. Um, and the example that, that Lois provided, it is, you know, needs to be from the last five or 10 years, for example. Um, in uh, like, I, I work with students who are working on their dissertations. A lot of times when I talk about these critical citation practices, it is with grad students. And they are often feeling a particular kind of pressure for either their theses or dissertations to cite the um, sort of foundational scholars in the field. Um, or they are worried that if they um, don't include uh, certain people that it's going to reflect badly on them. And this, these are very high stakes. These are like the high stakes papers, right? That you can write. You're either gonna get your master's degree or your PhD or you're not sometimes based on that. And as Amy points out in the chat, there's often a lot of pressure from advisors um, and it can be the, um, I see a lot of reproduction within academia and particularly in terms of scholarly communication. Like I learned it this way, I did it this way. So this is how we do it. Um, or with particular scholars, they might have like their favorites that they like to cite and then they might want grad students um, or other people that they're working with to cite those or they have some go-tos and they don't necessarily um, go, go too far beyond those go-tos. So relevance is kind of what I was expecting to hear here because relevance is super important, right? We, I, you know, we can't just say like, oh, I'm actually not going to focus on, you know, the content of the source. I just want to look at who wrote it and sort of what their personal background is. That's not going to be helpful for most people. Um, what I'm going to show now are a couple of case studies, and these are case studies. I want to start with this first one, and this is um, Sarah Ahmed's book, Living a Feminist Life. Um, and I pulled another quote out of here, well, more quotes in this than I usually use, but there's just a lot of interesting stuff. And she says, citation is feminist memory. Citation is how we acknowledge our debt to those who came before, those who helped us find our way when, we, when the way was obscured because we deviated from the paths we were told to follow. And if you're interested at all in women's gender sexuality studies, um, I would read at least the introduction to this book, Living a Feminist Life, because she talks, or if you're interested in citations, even beyond any of that other stuff, um, because she talks a lot about, and she makes very visible her citation practices, what she's decided to do. And she, she has a lot of interesting metaphors about sort of citations as bricks that we use to sort of build our like, scholarly dwellings, a lot of interesting stuff in there. But Sarah Ahmed in 2017, when this book came out, was a pretty established scholar. Um, she, you know, had a lot of speaking gigs. She's, you know, she, she has autonomy in a way that a newer scholar might not. And she uses that autonomy and, and talks, you know, sort of more in depth in this introduction about the fact that in this entire text, this full book, Living a Feminist Life, she does not say any white men. Um, and this is a very, like, if we think back, conscientious engagement from that Mott and Cocaine article, but that idea of intentionality, I am perfect not citing this kind of people. Now, I want to be clear, especially since this is recorded, that I am not personally me in any way suggesting that white men can't produce good scholarship or that we should never cite white men. What I want to use this case to show is how someone has um, sort of made a very specific decision um, because of the sort of scholarly freedom and scholarly positionality they had to focus on, uh, you know, women, BIPOC folks, 
um, people from groups that tend to be underrepresented in research and scholarship. So this is a really interesting case to me. That's the first case. Um, the second case um, is the sort of second example I mentioned back in my definition. This is the first time I had seen anyone, again, sort of make visible their citation choice um, to only cite uh, sources that were available open access. Um, and so this is from an article by Nina de Jesus. It's from 2014, so pretty, um, it's a while ago at this point. And it is from um, an article in, in the library with a lead pipe, which if you're familiar with in the library with a lead pipe, um, it does tend to be kind of a uh, progressive LIS publication. It is open access, it is peer reviewed. Um, and the articles tend to be sort of a mix of like a practical applications or research studies and also theory heavy kind of work. But she talks about this um, in her note and she does make an exception because she wanted to be able to use monographs, some text for monographs. Um, and those, as she says here, haven't been considered by the OA movement in the same way. Now that was 2014, I think things have changed with monographs since then. Um, but as far as articles and other scholarly resources are concerned, if I wasn't able to find a non-paywalled copy, I haven't cited it or used it. There are obvious and unfortunate limitations when strictly adhering to such a principle, since much relevant research remains locked up behind publisher paywalls. So she's making a choice and she's making a point. All right, she's making a point to say, uh, this is how I'm choosing to cite because I'm putting this in an open access journal. And I want people who are reading this open access journal to be able to access as much of what I have cited as possible. And I thought that was something that was that really sort of stood out to me as a practice because as is mentioned here, this limits you a lot, right? And maybe slightly less than it did in 2014, but there's still a lot of non-open access and um, publications out there, particularly in our field, which I think is funny and maybe ironic. And um, finally, I wanna give you this third case. And this is about, this is like my, in my definition, I talked about sort of uh, featuring other sort of epistemological practices. And this is from um, some scholars in Australia. And it's from an article called Intentional Fire Spreading by Firehawk Raptors in Northern Australia. Raptors the birds, not raptors the dinosaurs. I was pretty excited at first because I like dinosaurs. But here we go. One of the things that is said here, and I actually cut this quote way down uh, because it's very long, but um, I will, let me go ahead and paste the slides link back in here again in case you want to get to these um, and everything should be hyperlinked. Um, so they talk here about how they actually, they chose not to um, they chose not to cite unpublished sources from what they're calling traditional owners. And in Australia, these are mostly Aboriginal scholars and Aboriginal authors, but a lot of um, the sort of content that they were pulling from there was really in, the, in an oral tradition. Um, but they chose not to cite that because, not because um, they didn't respect it, but actually because they did, because they wanted to respect the knowledge that is held by those traditional owners, the indigenous um, people of Australia who have a lot of uh, knowledge about these particular birds uh, and, their, and their sort of activities and their fire spreading. Um, but they wanted to be respectful of the fact that uh, they couldn't appropriately cite this unpublished knowledge and they didn't want to use it without being able to cite it. Um, and then they talked a little bit about in this here that second, we are also carefully negotiating co-authorship to ensure all voices and contributors are properly acknowledged. And they are trying to plan some collaborative publications um, with uh, specific Aboriginal authors that they want to, they think will, will have benefit for everyone, right? Like it's gonna increase sort of value and deepen the scholarship that they're putting out, but it's also going to give, um, give credit, give appropriate credit to the traditional owners of this knowledge. So these are just three case studies and I picked these three out to sort of line up with the definition that I provided at the beginning that I use in thinking about this stuff. Um, to me, the thing that these case studies all have in common is again, that intentionality. We think about um, them, the, the choices that they're made 
uh, that they're making are um, very intentional, very conscious, very conscientious, as going, going back to Mott and Cockaine's work. Um, but they're also making these practices visible. This isn't just happening behind the scenes. We can imagine there are probably a lot of authors um, out there who make these kinds of choices, but don't necessarily um, make them visible to their readers. So to me, these are the things that these have in common, even though they are doing really different kinds of uh, actual practices, right? They're making different sort of practical choices. So um, what benefits are there to being critical about your citation practices? Uh, so making space for underrepresented scholars and authors is one that's frequently mentioned. Um, presenting new perspectives. So again, this, this brings together that concept of um, giving voice to underrepresented folks, but also that idea of different forms of knowledge, different ways of knowing, not just sort of indigenous ways of knowing or traditional ways of knowing, like in that third case study, um, but also one of the things that we that we see a lot in the fields I work with is the way that Black feminist scholarship in particular has sort of evolved and has um, prioritized um, in some ways and definitely made very visible different ways of doing scholarship, different ways of knowing and different ways of understanding and approaching the world. And also just this idea of working toward a really a more equitable or, you know, I used ethical here to reflect back on that quote from earlier, um, a scholarly communications landscape. So can you think of anything else, any other benefits um, that might come from these kinds of practices that I'm discussing, or even other practices that may be similar that I haven't talked about today? I'll give you a moment here and drink some coffee. Yeah, that's great, Anna. So Anna says, um, helping one helping one question their own assumptions about scholarship and what has value in citing and writing. Um, so this, I think, I like this idea on two fronts for us as like library workers. One, for our own scholarship that we might do, but also for helping other people, right? Helping other people find sources, helping other people make decisions. Um, I think that is an, definitely another benefit you know, thinking about this kind of stuff doesn't mean that you make a choice like Sarah Ahmed and say, well, I'm only ever going to cite, um, you know, non-white men authors, right? But it just means being aware of that space. Um, and uh, Suzanne mentions a Michelle Caswell article. Michelle Caswell has done a lot of really interesting um, work in archives um, and uh, I guess LIS more broadly, but um, really interesting stuff. And this particular one, which I don't think I have read, um, is an article where she cites the invisible labor behind writing for women. That's awesome. This is why I love the Yeah, if I was just gonna say real quick, so like she cites in the feminist tradition of making visible, formally invisible labor, she wants to acknowledge that the article was written as many feminist writings are in between childcare drop off and pick up while the laundry dried as the hair dye set after all the snacks have been eaten, et cetera, et cetera. But that's actually like a footnote in her paper if you click the link, which I thought was pretty interesting and in changing the dynamic there. Yes, that's per thank you so much. That's a great example. And, and like well, it says in the chat, that's really valuable because again, so many of these practices are very shrouded and that's sort of how, especially in academia, that's how we're taught to do things. We work, um, you know, when you're sco a scholar, you work on your own and you do your scholarship and you get it done and you cite your stuff. Um, I think libraries are better about, you know, um, being collaborative, but I don't think that we're necessarily better except for these kind of specific examples about, um, again, making visible what is invisible. Um, and I think that is really important and particularly for women. Um, and uh, I think that sounds like a really good example. So I'm gonna definitely um, put that on my list to read. Okay, oops, hold on, did I miss a slide? Okay, no, we're gonna talk about some potential drawbacks later. This is gonna be so much fun. I'm very excited about this. I have been waiting for a while to create an activity 
um, that put some of this work in practice. And we are, because I know all of you well and know that you are going to be kind and helpful, um, we are going to do this together. Um, and so I want to just sort of explain my process before I put you into the activity. It's solo activity, so you don't have to get in breakout rooms or anything. You don't have to talk to anyone if you don't want to. Um, this is the most recent, or at least as of yesterday, the most recent article um, from In Library with a Lead Pipe, which I mentioned. Um, and it is called Service Ceiling, the High Cost of Professional Development for Academic Librarians. And this is some work that this group of librarians has been doing for a while. I've, I've, I saw their study come out, national survey come out. Um, and also um, they did some presentations about this actually sort of during ACRL this year, an extremely expensive conference to attend, particularly for um, a virtual conference. Um, so this, again, as of I think yesterday, this was the most recent and so what I did was I grabbed all of their citations down here at the bottom. I took out anything that was not solo authored because I wanted to make this just time wise a little bit easier for us. Um, if I were doing a sort of lengthy activity like this with a class or in a workshop, I might um, I might just take out these sort of organizational examples and still use co authored sources, but I took out all co authored sources. Um, and then I put them in a spreadsheet, which you'll see, and I have assigned one to each of you. So let me paste the activity link up in here. <laughs> okay. Yes, Amy, this was, there was a lot of buzz about this. Oh, look, Lois already did it. Good job, Lois. Lois is in there. Um, where is there? And I really wanted to actually go to the session they did where they talked about their research, but I was out that day or I had a conflict. So that's the link to the um, activity and the activity is a spreadsheet. Um, and here, let me do, let me do a little freeze row here. Freeze row kind of situation. I can never remember where freezing is view. Okay, freeze one row. So I have assigned each of you in the order on which you appeared on my screen today. No. Um, Nothing, nothing else uh, about that. But what I want you to try to do in this activity is to see what information you can find about the author. Again, I suck solo authors here about their race or ethnicity. And if you can find anything, you know, how, how do they identify um, or what, you know, what, what are your thoughts there? And the same thing about gender identity. Um, and then figuring out, is there a way to freely access this particular source? Um, so again, this is an experiment, so I will be very open to your feedback. Um, and what I'm going to do right now, I'm actually just going to pause the recording because uh, we don't really need, uh, let's see, where is the recording? We don't really need this quiet time on the recording, so here we go, resuming the recording. All right, so I'm going to pull this up. Um, and talk through what we have been able to find and not find because both of those things are important. Um, so uh, Amy looked at Esberg, um, who seems to work in Canada, I agree. I, I tried to look, uh, look for information about this person as well. Um, I am with you. I don't, I didn't see pronouns listed anywhere and I didn't see any um, specific reference to race or ethnic identity, um, which I'll go back to that in a moment. Okay. Lois had Fabazi Atar, um, who very um, kindly has been pretty open about her identities, um, and, which is helpful um, for, for us when we're doing this kind of work, right? So she identifies as a first generation American queer and disabled woman of color. So there's a lot of um, it's a lot of information right there for us that we can sort of um, pick up and kind of get into. Um, Tiffany had Jennifer Ferretti, we just mentioned um, from Jennifer Ferretti's own website. She is a first generation American Latina mestiza. Again, great, very helpful. And her pronouns are available um, both on her personal page and on the We Here page. Um, 
sometimes when I struggle to find a person's pronouns, I will look at their like Twitter account or other social media accounts to see if they identify it there. Um, what I am seeing is that we, we do seem to have a lot of open access options um, for these um, for these sources, which is great. Um, and for Anna, Anna had a more challenging one, uh, couldn't find this info um, for either race or ethnicity or gender identity. Um, now uses a different name for work and publishing. Interesting. Um, so does use she, her pronouns in her bio. So this is what I have had to do in some places. So I, I gave the, um, I used that quote from the Mott and Cocaine article. Um, and I went out looking for information about them. And um, both of them have pronouns that were used on their sort of official university pages. So I assumed some things based on those pronouns specifically, I assumed that they uh, had approved the use of those pronouns. So um, they are a, a woman and a man, Ma and Cocaine. Um, nothing really that I saw anywhere about their race or, race or ethnicity. I assumed they were white. Um, and I'm bringing this up because Melody also mentioned with um, Halperin, I think it's Jenny Rose Halperin, um, possibly white from photos, but no specification. So, um, We've talked about this in the anti-racist reading group. We've even talked about this in some other ULVLC sessions, but a lot of times um, in uh, scholarly communities, uh, right, white, like white is seen as sort of neutral in some way, right? So if people don't identify and we look at them and we think they're white, that's sort of the assumption that we are gonna make um, because often, people who have chosen to identify specifically as people of color or to have shared their race and ethnicity so far are not people who um, identify as white. And this is a very small sample to be clear. Um, but yeah, so so this is, this is always something to think about. It is harder to find information um, confirming someone's white identity in my experience doing this work. Um, she, her um, from her website, um, so Suzanne had Mr. Library dude who I didn't look this up, but I had every assumption that this was a white man. Maybe that wasn't fair. Um, but it, you know, it seems like it's probably true. Um, definitely male. He's Mr. Library dude. Um, and, uh, has a photo, but doesn't specify, but we can probably look and, um, make some, again, make some assumptions. Now assumptions are dangerous. We all know. Um, Oh, he explains it. Okay, good. I assumed, you know, he, you know, if he's talking about membership costs being high, that he's probably not like a total monster, but you know, we'll see, we'll see. Okay. <laughs> I hope he's not watching this later. I hope he doesn't have a Google alert for like the audio transcript of this. Um, Mr. Library dude, I'm sure you're great. Okay, so I wanna hear from you now. And again, you can use the chat. You can use uh, your voice, however you want to do it. What went well, what didn't, and what sort of things generally did you notice? And we'll just talk about this for a couple of minutes before we start wrapping up. And I'll tell you that if I were using this in a class or a workshop, one of the things I already know that I would change is that I would tell my learners ahead of time that this is, these were the questions I was going to ask them after the activity, um, so they'd be paying attention to it, but I did not give you that advantage, so anything that you um, can share about what went well or didn't or what you noticed would be, would be great, so I am going to quiet myself for, for a moment or two. Hey, Jenny, can you hear me? Okay, so, um, so usually I like when I'm trying to find out more about somebody, I go to their social media first, because I just feel like that information, especially in like sort of the circles that I follow, um, like provides that information. But um, I was like, I was a little surprised that this person didn't have their pronouns in their um, Twitter account. Um, 
and like you said, I couldn't find any information about their right race. Um, there was some information about like some languages that she spoke, but you know, that doesn't indicate anything. Um, so it was, yeah, it was uh, not as easy as I thought it was gonna be because usually when I go to like somebody's Twitter account in their little bio, it says a lot of the information there. Yeah, yeah, thank you for sharing that, Melody. And I, I agree, This I just did a little uh, talk about critical citation practices last week for uh, a grad school writing boot camp kind of thing they were doing. They would do these breaks at noon every day for like a, a topic discussion. Um, and one of the folks there was, was asking me how, how to locate um, disability studies scholars who are disabled. Um, and this is, you know, another very much tied up in this idea of um, critical citation practices, or if you're like a big fiction reader like me, this concept of own voices writing, right, Re writing things that reflect your experience where you can um, sort of, you know, take on your, you know, your particular identity or some experience that you've had. Um, and one of the things, thinking about that in particular, thinking about um, disability studies, is that not everyone wants to reveal um, or, or identify that they're disabled. And that might be for job related reasons, it might be for, um, you know, personal protection, like there are lots and lots of reasons. But one of the places that I see people um, identifying as disabled scholars is on Twitter. Um, or on their social media. Uh, so I'll sometimes see people say disabled scholar or something, um, something like that. So uh, this is, social media has a lot of value for us here because for many scholars, it's gonna be, um, especially if they don't have like a website, it's gonna be their space that they maintain and that they control. All right. Um, oh, Melody found that the pronouns um, are listed, but that's okay. Twitter, you know. I don't, I'm just thinking like, I'm not sure I have my pronouns online because I don't really tweet um, hardly ever. So I'll fix that. So a couple of things I want you to keep in mind as you are thinking about this work is that it takes time. So each one of you had one, um, you know, one person to look at and, and that took time. I'm thinking about this for a full sort of citation list. Um, you know, it's gonna take a lot of time to sort of do this kind of audit of your own work. And a lot of times, that for, for the kind of thing we mentioned earlier, most of us focus on relevance. And so the kind of work that we're gonna do here is probably gonna have to be auditing those relevant things that we've identified to sort of see, um, is our bibliography you know, representative in the way we want it to be? Um, and you are sometimes gonna have to make assumptions um, because you are not, if you wanna do this work um, consistently, um, because a lot of times someone's not gonna say I'm white. Um, a lot of times people might not, you know, like uh, specifically identify their gender. Um, so we, we do have to make some assumptions or, or and that again, that can be dangerous, um, but you, this is usually work that we are doing um, for ourselves and work that we are doing personally. Um, and making these choices, like I said, is not always possible. Right, and it might be difficult depending on your field, what kind of autonomy you have. We've talked about this a little bit earlier already. Um, and I somehow have missed the slide. Somehow, I guess I deleted it. That's pretty cool. Um, I had a slide um, in in the ether somewhere that talked a little bit about um, a, and I'll add it to the slides. Uh, I'll add it back if I can figure out where I put it. Um, there is a, um, a talk that our WGSS department hosted through Zoom back in February, and Jennifer Nash, who is Dr. Jennifer Nash, who's at Duke University now as a feminist scholar, a Black feminist scholar, and one of the things she talks about in that, in that talk, um, she goes, I was so excited, she went all up in critical citations or the politics of citations. Um, and one of the things she talks about is it's really important for the for that work for going in and for looking for um, you know women of color to cite just as an example um, it needs to be genuine and not predatory um, so it needs to be something where you're not either just using it as a token to say like look I'm woke I cited these people um, and also 
you're not using it to, uh, she specifically uses this phrase left credential. So I think of it as sort of virtue signaling, like, look, I'm a, I'm a progressive scholar. I have cited uh, women of color kind of thing. Um, so I will fix that. I don't know, <laughs> like, did I put it in a different version of this presentation somewhere? Um, and if so, oops. Um, but I wanna share some resources with you. Um, and the, yes, performative citations, beautiful Lois, basically. She's like, don't do that. This is gross, don't do it. And I'm gonna put this link in here. And one of the things, this is, this is the resource that I usually share with people when I do like a workshop or a talk about this, um, where I have basically from like, from reading and thinking about this a lot, I have pulled together some questions to consider when you're thinking about your own citation practices. Um, not just sort of who we cite, but like, why do we cite certain things and what does it mean? Um, and then I also have a bunch of web resources related to this. Um, there are several blog posts that are really helpful. This, uh, there are also again, collections like, so I love Site Black Women. This is Site, Site Black Women Collective. One of the reasons I really like this particular uh, website and this particular sort of movement is that again, going back to that idea of sort of making the invisible visible, they make their praxis visible. These are their guiding principles. And, and this goes back to a little bit of what I was just mentioning from, from Jennifer Nash. It's not just about citing black women's work in this particular case, that's the population they're talking about. It's about reading that work. It's about um, engaging with that work and it's about acknowledging that kind of production and giving space. Um, they also have a podcast. Um, I know podcasts are so hot right now. Um, and for that reason, I also uh, listed both their podcast um, and a, an episode from a podcast called Secret Feminist Agenda, which goes into um, this idea of, of citing your sources being sort of a political act. And one of the things that she explores, if any of you have studied uh, WGS, is uh, she specifically talks about Michel Foucault, a white man who is like a, a sort of core scholar in women's gender and sexuality studies, kind of the thing where if you were writing an article that had any theory and you didn't mention him, um, people might be like, what are you doing? Why did you leave him out? And sort of questioning that, like, what does that mean for him to have been so foundational um, to a field that is otherwise about uh, women and gender and sexuality studies? And then I have a whole bunch of scholarly articles, resources, research reports, books, that kind of thing. Um, and I'm always trying to add to this. So if you, I might add that Caswell article as an example, um, but if you have anything that you think would be helpful to this, please feel free to email me um, and let me know about it. Um, but yeah, that is the resource list. At last, I last updated it last week. I added a few sources. One of the things I've been trying to do for it recently is to add a little bit more about um, open access and OER stuff. Um, so there was, let's see if I can find, there was, well, there was an OER one I added recently. That was very interesting. Yeah, this one, Valencianos G, um, Open Educational Resources, Expanding Equity or Reflecting and Furthering Inequities. Um, and one of the things you'll see is that I have um, used APA style here um, and APA intentionally doesn't use first names. And I've always been taught, I'm gonna stop my sharing now. I've always been taught that that was um, because uh, they wanted um, gender to be taken out of the equation. Um, and so that is one sort of additional thing that can make the citation kind of audit process, as I'm calling it, a little more challenging is if they use APA or any of those other styles that don't put full names. Again, that's still an assumption that's being made, um, but, you know, it's a starting point. So that's all I have. Thank you all for joining me today and thank you for, for doing my um, activity. I'm really happy that um, I had such a lovely audience to do it. And if you have questions or comments, we still have a few minutes before we wrap up. I thought the activity was great. I think that's a really interesting idea and a cool way to, to get students thinking more about this. So big props to you. Thank you. Yeah, I think I told you yesterday, Amy, I was like, I'm so excited I came off an activity. <laughs> Because I've been thinking about this a lot and how, how would I, how would I want to do this? And also again, like sort of be careful and be sensitive to say like, there are a lot of assumptions we can't make about people like, and be a hundred percent sure, you know, that we're right. 
Um, so I, I think the debrief here is, is really is an important piece of the activity. And I think that you like what you talked about with sort of people not identifying as white goes along with when we talk about trying to find articles about America <laughs> and how America yes. sort of sees itself as the default right. and so doesn't always geographically identify. So I think that's an interesting sort of parallel to draw. Um, I mean, it doesn't make us look great as either Americans or those of us who are white people, people but you know, <laughs> got it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we, we've had, we've had plenty of time. Yeah, exactly. All right. Jenny, I have a question. Yeah. Do you, I don't like, I don't know if you have been having like discussions with people about this topic, but I feel like in my experience, I have found resistance from people who like don't think it is important to like look into somebody's race or something like that because they're sort of kind of kind of like in this old school like liberal mindset of like no that's like you know that's that's not yeah. equality or <laughs> whatever yeah. um and uh yeah it's it's interesting to um to sort of like with uh, our practicum student, like we had her come up with like a list of um, books that we could potentially purchase that would add more like anti-racist uh, resources to our collection. And we like, we had her look into stuff like that and to look into if it's like an own voice and stuff. And she had a lot, she had a lot of discomfort with it, um, which I found interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. So I have, I will say, I have mostly talked about this with pretty receptive audiences. Um, so I've talked about this a lot with WGS faculty and WGS students. Um, I bring this up in most grad classes that I teach, but, but not like to this extent, usually more of like a something to keep in mind, you're a scholar, think about how you're, you know, what you're producing and what you're reproducing. Um, but this, this is something, yeah, I agree. I think there could be some resistance from people who are like, oh no, my, my scholarship is colorblind, right? I don't see, I don't see scholarly race um, or whatever, and, and might have that kind of discomfort. But I also, it was interesting during the session I did last week with the grad school, I had a student from a like sort of more natural science background who was like, no, this isn't like how we do things. Like what I need to do is, is like follow the science. I need to be able to follow, um, you know, the new, like the new, new stuff, basically. I need to follow innovations and I need to focus more on that. And so I do think there are probably field specific things. I think again, like obviously my faculty members and students in women's gender and sexuality studies are gonna be more receptive to this because it is sort of part and parcel of the work that they already do. Um, but if we are thinking about different disciplines or even sort of just different, um, you know, uh, again, different epistemologies, different ways of approaching um, how we know what we know, I think it is gonna be, um, it's gonna be challenging. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So thank you all so much. Um, if you ever want to talk about this more, I get pretty jazzed about it. So please do feel free um, to let me know. Um, yeah, Melody, I'd be happy to talk about this more. Um, so thank you all so much. This has been this has been so great, um, and I am I really appreciate all of you. And I hope everyone has an amazing rest of your day. Bye.